eight minutes after the hour of nine o'clock. This is the Mighty 1190 WIXC. We want to welcome in uh, to the studios this, uh, this morning uh, Carolina Urology Partners, uh, Dr. Ted Stimatakis and Dr. Arthur Lim. Join us as our guests this morning. How you doing, guys? Grab that microphone there and make like a rapper. Just get in. <laughs> How you doing, Dr. Lim? I'm doing just fine. I hope you are. Well, man, um, we're glad to have both of y'all I'm in. I'm doing Dr. fine, too. Stimatakis, uh this uh this practice that that you guys are at this is a a broad brush to paint with uh i just told y'all uh when y'all walked in the door i was in the other room canceling my subscription to one of these uh vitamin or mineral whatever i guess vitamin products is supposed to help with uh prostate health and say you won't go to the back it doesn't work i've been taking them since (laughs) march just exactly the way the label says and they just don't work or didn't for me anyway well, we're sorry to hear that, but uh, that's part of the reason why we're here yeah. this morning. You know, everybody wants to take a pill, though, and it go away. Well, I guess that's... Uh, <laughs> everyone in society wants a, a quick fix to everything nowadays. I wish they made a pill for ugly. I'd get some of them. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's talk about uh, your uh, uh, prostate for, for a minute. At what age should you start getting uh, checked during your, your annual? When, when does that start? When should that start? The American Urological Association recommends that if you have a family history for prostate cancer, that you should start getting screened at around 40. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you're African-American without a family history for prostate cancer, you should probably get screened at around 50. Okay. Okay. Um, There's been some debate about the the PSA uh, test. Tell, tell me your your thoughts on it. First, tell us what it is. Oh well, yeah, please. The uh, the PSA is a blood test that has been uh, around for about twenty years. Uh, that uh, helps us detect prostate cancer. Now, it is not specific for prostate cancer, but it is specific for prostate disease. And anyone with an elevated PSA. Uh, or let me just preface this by saying that if you have an elevated PSA does not mean that you have a cancer okay. elevated PSA can be due to a number of things. The most important thing that we're worried about is cancer, but it could also be due to infection of the prostate as well as enlargement of the prostate. So um, it, it's been an enormously valuable tool in detecting prostate cancer. Uh, that being said, uh, not all prostate cancers are, uh, deadly or ultimately going to cause the, the demise or, or the death of patients. But um, going back to your question about screening, um, there's been a lot of controversy about prostate mm-hmm. P, uh, screening with PSA. And the most recent um, uh, recommendations from the American Urological Society is that uh, patients have a discussion with their doctor regarding performing the yearly PSA test at the age of 55 and, and after. They're not recommending it being used as a screening tool, but that patients have a dis- discussion regarding doing PSAs uh, after the age of 55. All right, now, prostate cancer aside for a minute. Uh, enlarged prostate is not indicative of cancer, correct? Yes, that's uh very uh, that's accurate okay so what causes an enlarged prostate um no one knows exactly what causes an enlarged prostate but we believe uh that it has something to do with the hormonal environment uh uh, uh that of, of, of a man mm-hmm. specifically testosterone may have something to do low, t- low t we hear about um not necessarily low T, but an abundance of testosterone. And they, I tell you what, okay. that, that's something that's made the news here recently. They got everything from a, a testosterone deodorant to a P. I, I ain't never seen so much in all my life. You know, as doctors, just to get off the subject for a second, as doctors, I'm, you've got to be frustrated. That's not with, getting on your nerves. With all the commercials <laughs> that are thrown at, at us. And we have no idea. Ask your doctor about. They just walk so-and-so. in and say, "I want some of that gel." You know, and yeah. you don't need it. <laughs> yes, that's something that's been in the news lately. I'll let Doctor Lim talk about uh, testosterone because his is higher than mine. No, <laughs> 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 he's more of a man than I am. But no, I'm just kidding. Here, he can talk about low testosterone. Here we go. 
the problem that I see with media of late is that people tend to watch ads on TV and the television tells them what their disease process is. Yes, yes. And they get set in their mind that they have A, B, and C problems, and yep. therefore they've got this disease. Mm -hmm. And they come to a physician's office with information from doing a Google search, listening to what their pastor says, what the television ads say, and they swear that they have y a y certain condition. Y'all have got to hate Google. Uh, <laughs> well, a little bit of information. Because we all come in self-diagnosed now. A little bit of information is good, but a lot of information you get from Google and the Internet and media is unfiltered information. Yeah. And there, that is where a physician's advice comes in mm -hmm. and can play a significant part in getting your disease process addressed and your fears addressed. And we can do the right thing well, for patients by, you know, leading them down the correct diagnosis and treatment modality. You know, I had my father has an enlarged prostate, and and I have an enlarged prostate, and have for for a for a long time, and keep it checked, and and try to be careful with it, and try to do what we can for it, and uh, and they've checked me even for testosterone, and and I try not to have any preconceived notions, but it's easy. I mean, you watch the commercial and say, well, heck. That sounds like me. I, I'm going to go in and get some of that stuff. And, and then you go in and you don't realize, it, you know, you don't need it. It's, it's, it's you, not everybody needs well, the jail. It, 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 you know, it, it's marketed uh, to, to us. I want to get back to the, the prostate cancer, though. Um, and just some things I've heard as a lay person. You tell me if they're correct or not. If you live long enough, men, you live long enough, you will get prostate cancer. That is correct. Um, how long we got to live? I'm <laughs> the debate, the, the debate is, uh, men of X age, I'll let y'all fill in the blank that go in for procedure for prostate cancer, uh, may give up some quality of life. They may become incontinent, the, the different problems. And there's, so there's debate on whether a prostate cancer should, should be, uh, a surgical option should be on the table for certain men. Now I know every patient's different. I mean, these cancers may be different, but uh, you know, I, I, I think there's more and more men where doctors are telling them, yes, you've got prostate cancer. Um, but it won't be what kills you. What, what did you tell me, Dr. Stamakoff? You'll die. What you'll die with it. It's more likely that men will die with prostate cancer than, than from it. Um, typically prostate cancer is diagnosed in the older, uh, male population mm -hmm. and by older nowadays, that's a controversial, uh, term because, uh, 50 is the new, uh, 60 and what so I've been, on, what I've been saying. but, um, <laughs> uh, you're talking about an age group where people are often dying from, uh, diseases like heart disease or a stroke or chronic lung problems, or, or even other cancers. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the time a man reaches, for instance, 80, he's quite likely to have some uh, form of prostate cancer, um, at least based on autopsy studies that have been done of uh, men that have died in their 80s. It's but a slow, it's slow it, cancer. The majority of uh, prostate uh, cancers are slow growing. The dilemma in the diagnosis and treatment of this d disease is to find that subset of cancers that are aggressive, mm. because those are the the cancers that you can actually do something about. And the criticism of the prostate of prostate screening is that we're finding with prostate screening the slow growing cancers, but not enough of the aggressive type cancers to justify treating people for prostate cancer. Um, my and Dr. Lim's uh, feeling about this as urologist is at least patients should have a biopsy to know where you're starting from okay. as a baseline so that if a patient does have aggressive disease, he would benefit from, from treatment. And by aggressive disease, uh, that's detected... Uh, 
after the pathologist looks at, at the slides underneath the microscope. And we use a staging system called the Gleason scoring system. And for the details of that, uh, that's a whole other uh, uh, discussion. If, uh- we could, Dr. Lim. I wanted to uh, ask you, for most people who come in for whatever reason, uh, it's easy to just freak out, you know, it's uh, especially for a man. I, I think we we just, we tend to freak out more about stuff, I think, than women do. And and, and in a lot of cases, uh, they got an infection. Or, you know, it could be a, a bladder infection. It could be a an infection of the prostate. The, the thing is, we as men will put off going to the doctor yeah. until we either think we're going to die or something's going to fall off. And we shouldn't do that. I mean, sometimes it's not the end of the world. It's not always cancer. Sometimes it's just an no, infection. But men put things off. My my dad was the, the world's worst. Mm-hmm. I finally forced him to see Dr. Stamakakis, and he had a, a gallstone, bladder, no, bladder stone that was the size of a tennis ball almost before I could finally get him so, to go. Would it just, not, men are just bad about going. Would it not behoove us just to come on in and get checked out and, <laughs> and see Make, I mean, not as be as bad as we think it is. That is correct, and you certainly don't want anything falling off because you've ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can, I, I you agree. Can, if you feel that there is something wrong bothering your process of urinating, or if you've got certain aches and pains, it would not be a bad idea to come and see a physician. Very often, I see patients with back pain who walk into my office having done a Google search or talking to their family that they have back pain and they come in with a diag with their own diagnosis saying that they know that they have a kidney stone because it feels just like it because that's what they've read about. (laughs) When I end up examining them, I find out that they have either a pulled muscle or a prostate infection and after I do what I need to do, the patients frequently leave the office with a completely different diagnosis. And depending on what I find, if it's just a pulled muscle or a prostate infection, they usually feel better within a week. Yeah, you know well, something though. Here's the other thing too. How many times has somebody come in thinking they come in, they think they got a kidney stone? Anybody ever had a kidney stone? They bad. Yeah, all right, it's no, bad. No. If you, <laughs> if, you know, I, I pulled muscles in my back and I've had a kidney stone. And they're not even close. If how many times people come in <laughs> and act like they're mad because they don't have a kidney stone? It'd no. be like, man, I'm thankful. That's just, I, some people are like, oh, I'm supposed to have a kidney stone. What you don't can we want do it. to pre- help prevent kidney stone? The best habit to acquire is to drink large amounts of water and not tea, not soda, not juices, but water. And not beer. The, the, not beer. Beer, beer does contain a lot of water. 70%. However, the problem with beer is that it does contain alcohol in it, and alcohol works as a natural diuretic. So you would lose more free water by drinking beer than if yeah. you drank an equal amount of just water. I've also heard, I heard definitely about the water, uh, but something I do because I was told this uh, years ago when I had my, my, my kidney stone. Uh, I put lemon juice in the water. I've heard lemon juice helps break down a kidney stone, which can start from just a tiny, you know, my my doctor at the time said you probably got dehydrated and that formed a little crystal. And then from there it's on It's like a snowball, you know, it's like a sand spur and a snowball. Yeah, (laughs) that is correct. But but I've heard that, uh, he told me that the, um, the lemon juice, um, there were, there were some other juices, I think that helped break that down. Typically, lemon juice and citrus uh, drinks contain a large amount of citrate, which is a known inhibitor for kidney stone formation. Okay. You would have to drink quite a bit of citrus juices uh, in order to have a level high enough to inhibit stone formation. I see. Okay. There are tablet forms of uh, citric acid preparations which people would take twice a day or three times a day these are sometimes effective in that they can help prevent kidney stones however there's a small minority of patients that cannot tolerate those pills because they cause a certain amount of gastric or or, or stomach stomach upset now those patients that cannot take the pills 
usually get a recommendation from us to drink large amounts of lemon juice. And now of all the citrus fruits, lemon juice is the one that has the highest level of citrate. Okay. So if you had to choose one type of citrus drink, it would be lemon juice and it's not lemonade. Because yeah, lemonade right. is just a squeeze of lemon with a ton of sugar. So Sprite don't right. count either. Just Sprite so you does know. not count. And what he would have to do is squeeze out, get you a sack of lemon, squeeze out the juice, and mix it one part water, one part lemon juice, and drink yeah. about two or three glasses a day. He also asked me if I drank much iced tea. At the time, I was a minimum a gallon a day. Yeah, he drank a gallon of tea a day for 20 years <clears throat> and wondered why I got a kidney stone. Well, I didn't make the connection. All right, let's talk about uh, free, frequent urination at, at night. What, oh, now you're in my wheelhouse. Let's that, talk. That, what, what, what can be done about that? Um, the condition you described, uh, frequent urination at night, we refer to as nocturia. Um, and it's usually uh, characterized by someone getting up at least three or more times per night. I don't okay. do that. That's one. Um, the, oh, the, once is nothing. The first thing you we do as physicians is get a good history and physical. If someone describes to you the fact that he's drinking three cups of water at night before he goes to bed, then there you have your answer as to why he's getting up yeah. uh, so often. In this case, in, the, in in that case, it r relates to just the production of more urine at night. Yeah, but. Um, what you want to get an idea of is exactly how many times the patient is getting up at night, what kind of volumes he's, he's producing with each urination. Mm -hmm. And um, if there's any precipitating factors that are leading to this uh, uh, getting up at night, for instance, is he drinking caffeinated beverages at night? Or as I alluded to before, a large amount of fluids at night um, after you've, gotten that in the form of what we call a, a, a avoiding or bladder diary then you proceed to a, a physical examination and in men especially older men who get up uh, a lot at night it's very uh, often related to the fact that the prostate is is enlarged uh, this is the most common reason for men getting up many times at, at night and it's related to prostatic enlargement the same um, condition that causes men to uh, have difficulty during the day emptying themselves or having to strain to urinate. Um, in the females, it's often related to what's called a, an overactive bladder. Um, oftentimes you see on commercials uh, the phrase, gotta go, gotta go. Well, that refers to what's called an overactive bladder, a condition or an entity that's very, very common in, in females, especially middle-aged. So they feel like they really got to go, and then there's not a lot of volume there. Right. It's a, an intense urgency <laughs> and occasionally uh, leakage of urine accompanying that urgency that um, is, is called an overactive bladder. And there's medications uh, on the market, numerous medications, uh, as a matter of fact, like Detrol, Vesicare, um, uh, yeah, I remember, mirror Betric. I remember seeing the commercial for, for the men, and they're on the golf course, and the guys looking for the restroom at every hole, kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I, I hate to ask, I hate to ask a question this general, but but sometimes we have to assume people just don't know, and we're getting pretty short on time. Um, wh what, when should people? Because here, here's here's what I think people do. If you do get a uh, guy to go to the doctor, he generally is going to go and see his family doctor, which is which is okay. Do, do the majority of people that you you see, are they referred by a physician or, or should people just know when they may need to make an appointment with the urologist versus the family doctor? That, that's an excellent question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Who should we be seeing? Of course, our regular general, you know, uh, practitioner. I mean, should we skip going to our, our family doctor if we know it's when you get a certain age, should you have an annual with a urologist? Well, typically what happens is, well, in our practice, we see both types of patients. Patients that are referred uh, by another doctor, typically their, their family or in, internal medicine doctor, or patients that uh, are self-referred. 
Now, in urology, um, what happens a lot, in contrast to other specialties like, say, uh, an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, or an orthopedic doctor, we may not get the same uh, number or level of patients that so-called walk off the street mm-hmm. and, and see us. But we do get a combination of both. Um, I think that if someone experiences severe symptoms of uh, urination, they should come and see us immediately. Anyone with blood in his urine needs to see a urologist yeah, absolutely. immediately. Anyone with, with kidney stones uh, should really see us because we're we're the specialists. But the the patients for, do have the right though to do that if they want to call and make. Yes, of course, of course. Sometimes they will need to have a referral from their medical doctor. But by and large, when you're talking severe symptoms uh, of urination, blood in the urine, uh, kidney stones, leakage of urine, we're we're the go-to people for that. I'll let Doctor Lim elaborate on that as well. Let me just say something um, here. I needed to emphasize to our listeners that for the most part, most insurance companies do not require you to get a referral from a family practitioner. You are welcome to see any physician you want. You You have the right to see any patient you choose to go see. And it's very easy to pick up the phone and Find your own specialist if you think that is necessary. We typically do not have a very long waiting time. What's unique about our practice here in Monroe is that we are frequently able to allow people to make a same day appointment, and we would oh, that's awesome. We would be able to see them that same day. We typically don't have a long waiting time. Well, and we're able to work people in as long as they're willing to work with, you know, having to wait just a little bit in order for us to accommodate them into our schedule. Oh, man, that's awesome, because especially yeah. if somebody's got something like a kidney stone. It's, it's, oh, yeah. i tell you what I liken it to. It's like having a really bad infected tooth and the dentist saying, I can see you in three weeks. You know, you <laughs> that's wonderful to know. Many, many mothers who have given birth and have had kidney stones will frequently say that having a kidney stone is worse than childhood. I've heard that. I've heard that too. So that is, that yeah. that just tells you how bad kidney stone problems are. Yeah, Doctor Lim, I want to want to ask you uh, finally: um, Is impotence, or erectile dysfunction, an inevitable consequence? Boy, there's another of, one that's on TV all the time. Lord have mercy. Oh yeah, uh, they yeah. Have is, something is, to make that it, thing worse. is it inevitable? Is uh, is that just something we we're going to have to get used to? I think that as a man ages their hydraulic system tends to become a little bit compromised yeah but there are many things that will cause that hydraulic system to become compromised believe it or not sleep apnea is a very frequent cause of erectile dysfunction and Hmm. that goes undiagnosed because very few people will actually come to see a physician saying you know what i've got erectile dysfunction and sleep apnea and frequent because it don't work. And frequently, uh, it's up to the physician to get an idea based on either observation hmm. or physical examination that he would think that the patient might have some sleep apnea mm-hmm. issues. Yeah, but uh, there's a number of number of ways to to get around that uh, these days. My my question is, if it lasts four hours, do we really need to call you? Is it that big a deal? It would not be a bad idea. <laughs> Well, however, I don't see. A, I'm calling everybody. I don't see a whole bunch of people that have that problem. No, I don't either. And and I, it amazes marketing. me. You know, we started off talking about the commercials for the uh, low T. That there's a undoubtedly this place is in Charlotte. There's one commercial guy said 199 dollars. Give me ten minutes. If it don't work, oh, I'll give you money back in a mm-hmm. gift card. That's what. The, Oh gosh! All well, right, listen, well, just take care of yourself and and make an appointment and know that it, it's it's important. Yeah, right? it is. Uh, it's important. No, uh, no. As Doctor Liam said, that in most cases you don't mm-hmm. need uh, to be referred, and it's easy to find out. Uh, you could simply call your insurance company, and they can tell you uh, right over the yeah. phone if you need a referral if you're unclear about it. If if somebody needs to make an appointment. Oh, one other thing, uh, Doctor uh, Stematakis. Before we go, I want to ask you, uh, and this is the best comparison I know to draw it. Too. We've got a couple of people who advertise with us that have auto body shops. 
Somebody gets in a wreck. The insurance company says, okay, we're going to send you over here to XYZ shop. Well, the customer doesn't always know. They have the right to go kind of where they want to. Is it the same way if a, if a patient has a family doctor and they get referred to a urologist, do they as a patient have a right to say, hey, I would like to go see Dr. Lim or Dr. Stimatakis? Can they do that? Uh, absolutely. Um, patient, uh, it's the patient's body. He's He's got every right to decide what um he doctor he would like to see and who he would like to uh be taken care of so they him. could simply just say hey i would really like to see him at carolina urology partners and then the doctor's gonna refer yes that. yes uh, absolutely and the uh the uh office is uh, located uh right across from the uh hospital on uh ellen street correct uh, yes. 1428 ellen street which is across yes uh, i mean you, you literally right behind visit. monroe family medical yeah 704-289-4361 Yes. Um, and it's, it's just important. I mean, don't put off stuff like this. No. Uh, it's, it's not going to get better, typically. You don't, you know. Guys, we really appreciate your time. And we we'll let y'all do. go back to Thank work. Thank you. And, and Dr. Lim and I uh, really appreciate you, yeah, well, we you guys having, you, having your, us on your, your show. Time. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Thank you. We'll mm-hmm. be back. Y'all stick around, okay?